All righty, let's see here, boys and girls. Hello, 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 and welcome to another scintillating, didactic, and provocative commercial law and ethics session. Today, we're going to discuss one of my very favorite subjects, accountants' liability. All right, so why... In commercial law and ethics, are we spending time discussing accountants and accountants' liability? Well, you know, history, I think, is a, is a good teacher for us. So let's go back in time about, you know, 16 years ago. So in June of 2002, we had the stock market, stock market that lost 20% of its value in just a couple of weeks. Now, that ought to be a wake-up call because one asks the simple question, well, when the stock market loses 20% of its value, how much money is that? Well, we're probably talking trillions, right? Trillions of dollars? And so for everybody that's got 401k uh, plans and Roth accounts and not to mention uh, uh, over 50% of all stock is held by, you know, insurance companies and pension funds. I mean, clearly this was, as I phrase it, a significant emotional event uh, for Wall Street, not to mention the entire, you know, country. Now, I realize that many of you may have been just toddlers in the 2002 but I'm sure your parents uh, can uh, recall that time and that it was somewhat earth-shaking. Well, what brought about this 20% loss in the stock market value? Well, would you believe uh, we had WorldCom uh, go into bankruptcy, which at the time was the largest business bankruptcy in history? So we could easily say historically, yeah, that's a significant event, right? And then, of course, we had the infamous Enron disaster as well. But what was truly fascinating is that after these two behemoths uh, went belly up, we had hundreds of companies who restated their earnings. Now, clearly, all finance uh, departments have uh, battalions of accountants. And uh, what do accountants do? Well, you're thinking, well, they count money. Well, I think they do more than that. I think accountants are fundamentally, and I, and I mean this in a positive way, are storytellers. If numbers involves the language of business, the storytellers who tell us, you know, what the numbers mean, is your company insolvent? Is your company making a profit? Uh, Accountants convey that information, not only to managers, but to investors and certainly uh, Wall Street and, you know, the uh, public uh, at large. And so after the bankruptcy of WorldCom and Enron, we had a tremendous emphasis of uh, companies uh, boring down and looking very hard at their assets and their liabilities and they restated uh, their earnings. I mean, like uh, we had, you know, 2,000 companies restate their earnings. Well, in business, when a company restates its earnings, what does that mean? What that means is, oops, we got our numbers wrong. And if we have our numbers wrong, then clearly our story is going to change, right? And so as we're going to see in some cases we're going to review today, we have some companies that originally thought they were profitable, but when earnings were restated, uh-oh, they found out they were not profitable. In fact, that they were insolvent. Again, we can all agree that produces a significant emotional financial event. Now, as we previously discussed, to every action, there is a reaction on Wall Street. And so <clears throat> when we had uh, the demise of both WorldCom and Enron, followed by uh, restatement of earnings on such a uh, massive scale, 
um, there was certainly a reaction by uh, investors. And we're talking about not just private investors like you and me, but certainly those pension funds, uh, those insurance you know, companies and all that have uh, enormous investments in uh, equities and bonds. Well, uh, believe it or not, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley was a uh, law that uh, went through Congress, was enacted by Congress uh, in breakneck speed. Uh, I mean, warp speed for sure. And so Sarbanes-Oxley um, produced some new requirements, uh, more restrictively regulating uh, the accounting uh, industry. One of the things it did is it created the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, better known as the PCOB. Well, all right, so what does this new governmental agency do? Now, I realize there are a lot of people that think, oh, government regulation you know, is a bad thing. We ought to get rid of it all. Really? Do we want to see more too big to fails? Do we want to have more uh, big companies go into bankruptcy and have these restatement of earnings? I mean, all those things happen because of a lack of appropriate and effective regulation. So going back to, to every action, uh, there is a reaction. So the reaction, the regulatory reaction, was the creation of Sarbanes-Oxley, and within it, uh, the institution of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. What does it do? This board ensures that investors receive accurate and complete financial information. Well, gee whiz. Why is that important? I mean, does not the doctrine of caveat emptor, Latin for let the buyer beware, place responsibility on the investor to obtain their own investment information? Why do we need the government, you know, regulating the dissemination of financial information? Well, why do we need the government regulation? on dissemination of financial information because of nice disasters like WorldCom and Enron that revealed massive fraud, massive. Well, let's peel back the onion. So what happened to WorldCom with CEO Bernie Ebers? His fraud uh, was so criminal, uh, not only was he prosecuted for it, he got over 20 years uh, in jail. And he was the CEO. And what happened in Enron? Well, Ken Lay, the CEO, was prosecuted, found guilty of fraud, and before he went to jail, he died of a heart attack. Jeffrey Skilling, the president of Enron, he got to go to jail for 20 years. Um, Arthur Fastow, the CFO at uh, um, Enron, he got to go to jail for seven years. So, do we really need the government to be policing that type of conduct? Uh, the public thought so back in uh, 2002. And so we not only uh, prosecuted uh, the miscreants, the corporate miscreants, but we also needed to create uh, some more regulatory agencies and protections for Joe Q public. So the question, you know, is asked today, you know, should the government be regulating public companies when investors ought to be watching and checking on them? Well, do we really have the ability to do that? Does an investor have that type of capability and expertise and time and, and? I mean, when you're facing companies the size of WorldCom and Enron, really now, you know? So the Peacock. You know, is the PCOB unfairly interfering in public companies when it claims to have found audit errors in one third of the big four accounting firms except KPMG and accounting practices and gave them only one year to correct them, which has not been done? Does this sort of communicate to you why we need government regulation and maybe it's not uh, as bad as some people think they are? Clearly, who's, who is screaming, who's complaining, who is whining 
about the need to roll back uh, Dodd-Frank and Sarbanes-Oxley. Who's making all that noise? Could it possibly be the very same people who brought you in living color too big to fail? So look at who is doing the whining and look at who is being protected by these regulatory laws and agencies. And I think uh, by and large, as you can see, this data shows, uh, maybe these laws and these agencies are performing a very useful and necessary function to protect the public. Because financial information ought to be accurate, right? Because we rely on it, for better or for worse. So uh, let's move on and consider the question, is Sarbanes-Oxley wrongly interfering in free enterprise by requiring auditors to report to a company's board of directors instead of to management? that has day-to-day -day authority to make corrective changes. So when an auditor today under Sarbanes-Oxley finds um, wrongful activity, it has a legal obligation, a legal requirement to report to the company's board of directors and not to management. Because as we've seen with certainly WorldCom and Enron, management may be up to their eyeballs in terms of misconduct. And the board of directors, you know, are legally responsible for, to the shareholders, for the operation of the company and for supervision of its management. So, what does uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, better known as SOX, require? That significant flaws have to be reported that involve the company's internal controls. We'll talk more about internal controls in a minute. Are there alternative options that the firm considered in preparing financial statements? And are there accounting disagreements with management? So for example, well, we'll talk about Enron in greater detail here in just a moment. So how about this question? Why does Sarbanes-Oxley prohibit accounting firms that audit public companies from providing consulting services to those clients involving bookkeeping, financial information, systems, human resources, and legal issues. So why can't an auditor do both functions? Audit plus provide consulting services, which uh, certainly Arthur Anderson, which we'll talk about later on, used to be one of the big five. But Arthur Anderson no longer exists. Guess who was the accounting firm for Enron? Guess who is the accounting firm for WorldCom? Guess who is the accounting firm for Health South? And go through the 100 biggest uh, bankruptcies of the past 20 years, and uh, guess who the accounting firm was? Oh, baby, you got it, Arthur Anderson. Which reminds me of uh, one of my favorite stories about uh, accountants and accounting. Uh, you have a CEO who's taken over a new company, and he says, look, I want to see three people right away. I want to see the chief of human resources, I want to see the general counsel, and I want to see the CFO. Okay, so in comes the chief of human resources, and the new CEO asks him, so how much is one plus one? Well, the um, uh, chief of HR says, well, sir, I think it's two. He says, fine, send in the lawyer. So in comes the general counsel. He asks him the same question. How much is one plus one? Well, the lawyer looked around and said, sir, I think it's still two. The CEO says, thank you, uh, send in the bean counter. So in comes the chief financial officer. He asks him the same question. So what's one plus one? Ah, oh, the CFO gets up. He goes over and he draws the drapes. He shuts the light off. And then he sits in a chair right next to the CEO and he whispers in his ear, what do you want it to be? So that's my little story about uh, consultants and the Arthur Anderson a way of uh, accounting. So the question, of course, was asked, hey, Sarbanes-Oxley prohibits uh, an accounting firm providing not only auditing service, but also 
at the same time uh, consulting services because isn't there a inherent conflict of interest that the company is auditing its own uh, you know consulting service results so is there a conflict of interest here I think reasonable minds would say, yeah, I think there's a reasonable uh, conflict of interest here that should be avoided. And so SOX prohibits that. How about SOX's requirement that um, uh, after five years, the lead audit partner has to rotate off a, a, a client's account for five years and other partners must rotate off every seven years for at least a two-year period? Isn't this unfair and costly and deprive uh, uh, an accounting firm of a good client and uh, uh, a client of the uh, accumulated expertise uh, over a period of time? Well, <clears throat> do you see any problem with only four accounting firms auditing 98% of companies with revenues over $1 billion? Hmm. Does the accounting firm have a financial interest, as Arthur Anderson did, in making their clients look good? But in fact, like in Run and Worldcom, they weren't <laughs> very financially healthy. In fact, they were insolvent. So the PCOB has proposed uh, even publishing the name of the supervising auditor for each audit. Ooh, but the auditing firms say, oh, this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea to put an auditor's name for each audit. Really? So the question comes up, so who do accounting firms owe an obligation to? If we apply some ethical uh, rules here, what would Immanuel Kant and his categorical imperative uh, say? What would John Stuart Mill and his utilitarian ethics model say uh, about this situation? What is the decision that should be made that would be okay if everybody else uh, behaved in a similar way? Or what result will have the best outcome for the most amount of people? Good questions. So why such a big to-do over auditing reports? Why should we be interested in auditing reports? Well, <clears throat> because the fundamental role of auditors, right, accountants uh, who are, perform auditing functions, is to evaluate financial statements issued by management to investors and creditors. Now, clearly we have seen lots of intentional, uh, if not at least negligent financial statements that have been put out uh, by management to try and persuade uh, investors uh, and creditors um, to management's point of view, when in fact, factually, they may be wrong or an error. And so auditing reports are admission tickets, if you will, to capital markets. In other words, uh, banks, and there were 10 banks that loaned uh, Enron uh, money, uh, lines of credit. Uh, and of course, Arthur Anderson was providing uh, those banks uh, audit reports that showed Enron to, be, uh, to have a clean bill of health, when in fact, you know, they were insolvent. So what is it that accountants do that provide us accurate evaluations in the form of financial statements regarding a company's uh, fiscal health? Well, we have what's called the mirror image processes. We have vouching and tracing. Vouching involves auditors checking back to identify data that supports it. So while uh, you've got financial reports, like earnings reports, you're going to have the auditor who's going to look back and investigate, so where did the earnings come from? Tracing. Checking an item of original data and tracing it forward to ensure that it's been properly recorded through the bookkeeping process. So what are the rules here with respect to auditors? Well, the gap, generally accepted accounting principles, 
and the generally accepted auditing standards are the rules that CPAs and accountants are required to follow. Now, the IFRS stands for the International Financial Reporting Standards. Now, it's different from the GAAP because it takes a more liberal view in terms of valuing assets. Now, notice the operative word here is international because we have a lot of companies, <clears throat> multinationals, for example, overseas. And while uh, many companies have gone to using not only the IFRS standards, but also the GAAP and GAS standards and make sure that they've covered all the bases. So when we start using accounting terms, I, I like to call it the good news versus bad news accounting style, what types of reports do accountants auditors provide at the end of their uh, audit. The first one is called uh, an unqualified opinion, which is the best uh, audit report you can get because it says essentially, hey, everything uh, is fine with this company. The company's operating according to uh, proper GAAP uh, standards, and uh, we have found the company and the data furnished to be accurate and forthcoming. But what about a qualified opinion? So a uh, <clears throat> trustworthy uh, accounting uh, audit <clears throat> that issues a qualified opinion says, look, you know, uh, our statements, the financial statements are generally accurate, but there's an unresolved issue. This usually involves some information management doesn't want to turn over to the auditors for some particular reason. And so ah, the auditors make a point of uh, identifying that, look, there's a piece of information we requested, management won't turn it over. They claim it'll affect some acquisition that they're involved in or some such thing. But that obviously raises eyebrows, as it should. What's an adverse opinion? Uh-oh. Well, adverse opinion is certainly a bad news opinion that a company's financial statements do not accurately reflect its financial position. And what's a disclaimer of opinion? Hey, look, we can't even give an opinion because there's insufficient information available to form an opinion. It's not as bad as uh, an adverse opinion, but I'll leave it to your imagination as to how bad it is. So... One of the questions, you know, I like to uh, encourage our accounting students to ask here when they do uh, internship and employment interviews is to ask their interviewer, so over the period of your uh, accounting career, how many adverse opinions have you issued? That usually startles them because as a norm, uh, they will usually tell you uh, uh, none as a norm. Now, you're thinking, oh, uh, wait a minute, isn't that odd that they never issue an adverse opinion? Well, the way most audits work, of course, is when they're conducting an audit and they find an error. Now, regardless of you know, how it gets you know, uh, surfaced, once the company becomes aware of the error, so the auditor is there and points it out and says, look, you know, this doesn't balance with this particular account, and the company accountant says, geez, I think we made a mistake. Well, what do they normally do? Well, they fix it, right? They fix it. That's the norm. And so you don't have any errors now because it got fixed. And that, of course, is one of the positive aspects of uh, uh, an audit is that it uh, surfaces errors. We're all humans, right? We make mistakes and gives the company an opportunity to repair it, to fix it. So what happens when <laughs> you have bad information, inaccurate information, maybe even fraudulent information? What's the legal basis for suing accountants? Well, certainly uh, the way uh, accountants do business is with a contract. 
often referred to as an engagement letter that contains both express and implied terms. Now, express terms obviously involves providing the audit report by a certain date, usually certainly well before a company's annual shareholder meeting. There are implied terms in an engagement letter contract that the audit will be performed in accordance with reasonably accepted uh, accounting standards. So obviously we're talking about the gap and the gas uh, that we previously mentioned. When accounting firms do get sued, and believe it or not, uh, over 20% of accounting firms' revenue goes for insurance and litigation. So certainly there are lots of actions based on negligence. What is negligence? Uh, the failure to use due care under the circumstances that would be expected of an ordinarily prudent accountant. Uh, and that there was certainly uh, harm caused as a consequence. So let's take a look at this case, which illustrates the point I'm trying to make. So we've got this company, Oregon Steel Mills, uh, that's hired Coopers and Libran to be their uh, accountant to conduct uh, an audit. So the company was a publicly traded company whose financial statements were audited uh, by Coopers. Now, when Oregon sold stock in one of its subsidiaries, Coopers advised it that it should be reported to the IRS as a gain of $12.3 million. Just when Oregon was to file a stock offering with the SEC, it found that Coopers had misreported its earlier gain, which delayed its filing from May 2nd to June 13th. Now, during the period of delay, Oregon's uh, stock fell $16, from $16 to $13.50. So Oregon filed suit against Coopers claiming damages. The difference in what it would have received in stock sales had its filing been made on May 2nd. So the legal question is, did, the, did Coopers' negligence cause the loss to Oregon? Now, the evidence indicated that the increase and then the decrease in the steel company stock prices, including Oregon's, during the May-June time frame was due to market forces, right, unrelated to the financial condition or Cooper's conduct. So there was no, no relationship. And so uh, the accountant had no duty to protect Oregon against market fluctuations in uh, the stock price. So no connection no direct connection. So when can an accountant be liable for fraud? As we have seen in uh, the infamous Arthur Anderson case. Well, <clears throat> liability for negligence or fraud, in this case fraud, involves making a false statement of fact. Yes, the company is fiscally healthy, when in fact it is not fiscally healthy as in Enron's case, that is known to be either untrue or made with reckless disregard of the truth. <clears throat> and all the accountants I've known are anything but reckless, right? And we have foreseeable users who rely upon the work product, which obviously creates problems. This can involve, when you have fraud, uh, you can have punitive damages uh, sought besides compensatory damages. Now, the question that's in play right now that uh, the uh, uh, Treasury Department has put out a uh, uh, proposed rule regarding creating a fiduciary duty between investment advisors, financial advisors, uh, and clients. So what is a fiduciary duty? I refer to this as the F word for my students because they need to pay attention to what this legal term means. It's a legal duty to act with utmost trust for the benefit of a client and to put that client's interest first. Yes. Now, currently, there is no fiduciary duty between accountants and their clients. Why is that? Well, because historically there hasn't been that accountants have been hired to perform duties, but that they're not 
uh, investment advisors that they just perform uh, auditing uh, and tax preparation duties. And if they deviate from accepted accounting practices, that is deviate from uh, the gap or the gas, well then there can be ne negligence liability. So looking at the, the Lieber versus Konigsberg case, we've got Lieber who <clears throat> was a trustee for a charitable trust, uni trust, that had four million at its peak. Now he retained this uh, CPA by the name of Konigsberg, who advised that he invest all the trust assets in Bernie Madoff's investment company that turned out to be a Ponzi scheme. Does everybody remember Bernie who made off with everybody's money? Big Wall Street uh, scandal. So Lieber alleges a breach of fiduciary duty in that he made the investment based on Cronenberg's uh, financial advice and promised to personally supervise, monitor, and provide due diligence for the trust account with Madoff. Well, didn't happen, right? So Konigsberg filed a motion for summary judgment saying, hey, under New York law, he had no fiduciary duty to Lieber. And that's the question. Do accountants owe a fiduciary duty to clients? Well, the law is, while accountants do not normally owe their clients a fiduciary duty as a general rule, an accountant may be found to have assumed additional duties of care when acting as a financial advisor. So in other words, Konigsberg stepped out of his role of an accountant and now became a financial advisor. Ah, who owes a fiduciary duty. And so uh, where there is an allegation that a client has placed total trust and reliance upon the accountant's investment advice and the accountant concealed pertinent information about those investments, a fiduciary duty may exist. The violation of which... Uh, can result in uh, at least uh, negligence allegations, if not even uh, fraud. So certainly in the Konigsberg case, you had negligence. So what is the legal basis for liability of accountants to you know, uh, clients? Well, a breach of a duty by failure to exercise the degree expected of an ordinarily prudent accountant, okay? Violation of the duty that caused harm to the client. And there are three, you know, standards that are out there in the accounting world by which we judge this. The first is called the Ultramaris Doctrine, which is followed by uh, a handful of states where liability attaches only if the accountant knows a third party will actually see the work product. The third party relies on the work product for a known purpose, such as stock registration and there's harm. A second uh, form of uh, liability is called the foreseeability doctrine. What is it? First, that it was foreseeable that the a third party would receive the work product from the accountant's client, that the third party relied on the work product, and that, of course, there was harm. The last and the most popular form of uh, negligent standard is simply referred to as the restatement standard. Now, this is the one South Dakota and a majority of states follow, which says, look, liability attaches to anyone who the accountant knew would rely on the work product or anyone else in the same class. Now, our Ellis versus Grant Thornton, you know, case is a quick, you know, uh, case on that. We've got the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency that requires the bank to employ an independent auditor, conduct an audit. Uh, Thornton Auditing was hired and San Quay was its lead auditor. He subsequently overlooked, get a load of this, overlooked a discrepancy of $515 million between the reported and actual value of the loans uh, that the bank had in the report of $184 million in shareholders' equity when, in fact, the bank was insolvent. You think this was a minor um, accounting mistake? All right, so the audit report contained a disclaimer that its report was intended for the board of directors and its management only, and regulatory agencies, of course, but not for any third parties. Nevertheless, Quay told a prospective candidate, Ellis, for the bank's presidency that the bank would, would receive a clean and qualified opinion. 
Based on this, Ellis quit his former job and came to work at the bank, of course, only to find out that it was insolvent. So the bank uh, got shut down uh, five months later, and Ellis sued uh, the auditors here for false reporting that resulted in his lost wages, a uh, meager $2.4 million. So the question is, is Grant Thornton liable to Ellis for its negligence in preparing the financial statements? Now, there are six elements required to find liability here. The first was inaccurate information. Okay, we got that. Negligently supplied. We certainly have that. In the course of an accountant's professional endeavors, we got that. To a third person or limited group of third persons for whose benefit and guidance the accountant actually intends or knows will receive the information. Uh-oh, we don't have that, right? Because the accountant prepared the report for the board of directors and management, not for interviewees for the presidency. Fifth, for a transaction the accountant actually intends to influence or knows that the recipient so intends, and to the extent the third party relies on the information to his detriment. So you got five out of the six, but you're missing number four in this particular case. And so since the fourth element is missing, no liability on the part of the accounting firm to the now uh, bankrupt uh, bank president. The Securities Act of 1933 requires registration statements, which is what, of course, if you want a public uh, company uh, stock offering, you have to file a registration statement with the SEC. Well, guess what has to go along with the registration statement? Ah, audited financial statements are required. They're not optional. So in the preparation of those, audited financial statements, auditors are liable for any misstatement or omission, losses suffered as a consequence. Now, are there any defenses here that a auditing firm can assert? Yes, that engaged in a reasonable investigation of the financial and the financial statements, <clears throat> of the financial statements, and that there's reasonable grounds to believe no material misstatements or omissions were contained, and if they follow the gap and gas, which of course is the norm in auditing, hey, that's their get out of jail free card, if you will. So we've got uh, another case here um, involving Ernst & Young, who was uh, at the time one of uh, the big five uh, accounts in the country. Um, <clears throat> so we've got an interesting problem here of where uh, We've got Nay, who's president of this small brokerage firm, which he owned most of it. He convinced some customers to invest funds in escrow accounts that would yield a high rate of return. Um, what was odd, of course, was that the investments were unusual and that the customers wrote their checks to Nay personally, not to his firm for securities. Sound odd to you? Should put you on notice. No, 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 no. That's not the way business is conducted. None of the escrow accounts appeared in First Securities records. Surprise, surprise. So obviously we have some fraud involved here, and it comes to light when they killed himself, leaving uh, a note that uh, the company was bankrupt and the escrow accounts were spurious, that is, false. So in investigating the fraud, customers discovered that they had a rigid rule that prohibited anyone from opening mail addressed to him. Even if it arrived in his absence, customers allege that Ernst, the auditor, should have discovered this uh, uh, mail rule and fraud if it had conducted a proper audit. So they sued under SEC Rule 10B. Now, was Ernst liable under Rule 10B when it acted negligently but not intentionally? The words manipulative or deceptive, which is used in conjunction with device or contrivance, strongly suggest that 10B was intended to prohibit knowing or intentional misconduct. In view of the language in 10B, which so clearly uh, connotes, that is, indicates intentional misconduct uh, for the statute, uh, we don't have that here in this case. We have negligence, yes, but we don't have intentional misconduct, that is fraud. 
Now, this Arthur Anderson case is not in your uh, textbook, but I want to share it with you because obviously it was a lead case uh, at its time when the government uh, sued um, Arthur Anderson. Um, I recall, because I had a friend of mine in uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office in, uh, he, in uh, San Antonio, Texas, I'd heard Arthur Anderson wanted to plead guilty to uh, some uh, lesser included offenses. So they were being charged with fraud and a number of things. Uh, and they wanted to plead guilty to some lesser included offenses. Um, and the Department of Justice refused to even engage in negotiations with uh, Arthur Anderson. And I found that odd because I'd never, you know, before re heard of the federal government refusing to engage in guilty plea negotiations. Well, my friend told me, as an assistant U.S. attorney, that the decision had been made at the highest levels of the Department of Justice that they were going to kill Arthur Anderson, i.e., put it out of business. I, in my life, have never heard of the government setting out to kill a company. Well, <clears throat> Unfortunately, Arthur Anderson had a long history of playing loose and fancy free with auditing standards. So, of course, we know Anderson was Enron's auditor, and we had a senior Anderson accountant at Enron who told two Anderson partners that Enron could face serious accounting scandals. Boo hoo. After the Wall Street Journal ran an article, Suggesting improprieties at Enron, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, opened up an investigation. And of course, who are they going to talk to? So the Enron in-house counsel, Nancy Temple, realized by October that the SEC investigation was highly probable. At a training uh, meeting with Anderson uh, partner Odom, attended by 89 employees, to include 10 from the Enron engagement team, Odom urged everyone to comply with the firm's document retention policy, stating that if documents are destroyed in the course of normal policy and litigation is filed the next day, that's great. Three times that month, Temple reminded Anderson's employees of this policy. So you can imagine, <clears throat> the employees are lined up at the shredder to get rid of all these documents because the subpoena is going to be forthcoming. So Anderson employees did destroy a substantial number of documents, but guess what? The really smart employees held on to them because they knew what was coming. Subsequent to being served with a subpoena by the SEC in November, Anderson partner Duncan ordered cessation of the shredding. Smart move. Anderson was subsequently indicted for knowingly, intentionally, and corruptly persuading other persons to it its employees with the intent to cause them to withhold documents from and alter documents for use in official proceedings. Oh, baby. And so the legal question is, did Anderson employees commit a crime when they destroyed and run documents? The jury instructions got screwed up, and this is where the judge went wrong. The jury instructions simply failed to convey the requisite consciousness of wrongdoing. For example, the jury was told, wrongly as it turned out by the judge, even if Anderson honestly believed and sincerely believed that its conduct was awful, was lawful, you may find Anderson guilty. Hmm. That should have jumped out at you right away that there's something wrong with that instruction. A knowingly corrupt persuader cannot be someone who persuades others to shred documents under a document retention policy when he does not have in contemplation any particular official proceeding in which those documents might be material. So knowledge that actions are likely to affect a judicial proceeding is necessary for an intent to obstruct. But guess what? By the time this case gets to the Supreme Court in 2005, where is Arthur Anderson as a company? So Delta Airlines and everybody else who had them as an auditor dropped them like a hot rock. And so she sunk beneath the waves and, of course, is no more. Who wants to have an auditor with that type of um, reputation and those accusations um, being your auditor? You have lots of others to choose from that don't <laughs> carry the same reputational baggage. The uh, Gould versus uh, Winstar uh, case um, is a more recent case where we've got uh, 
Thornton, who's uh, audited Windstar, a communications company that provided uh, business with uh, internet connectivity. Now, while Windstar was one of GT's largest and most important clients, only 12% of the company's fees came from auditing. The rest came from consulting projects, just like Arthur Anderson, who provided both consulting and auditing services to Enron and WorldCom finding no problems with their operations at all, right? So Windstar asked GT to replace the partner in charge of the audit, and that if they did not, they would fire GT as their auditor and consultant. So what does GT do? They comply and replace their lead auditor with two inexperienced auditors who had no experience with communications companies. So when Windstar's real revenues fell, began to report fake ones. Rather than spreading revenue over the life of the various leases, it reported most revenue when the document was signed. These practices violated GAAP and SEC rules. At first, GT warned that the transactions were red flags and warranted further examination, but GT ultimately allowed the revenues and issued an unqualified audit opinion. <laughs> Guess what happened next? When Windstar filed for bankruptcy, Companies that had purchased Windstar stock after GT had issued its clean opinion filed suit against GT alleging securities fraud under SEC Rule 10B. So GT filed a motion for summary judgment that was granted and the plaintiffs appealed here. And the question is, did GT possess the knowledge, scienter means knowledge, necessary under 10B? What's the rule? The rule is, Center based on recklessness may be demonstrated where a defendant has engaged in conduct that was highly unreasonable, representing an extreme departure from the standards of ordinary care to the extent that the danger was either known to the defendant or so obvious that the defendant must have been aware of it. Well, when we apply these facts to this rule, what do you think? Yeah. There is some evidence that supports the plaintiff's contention that GT consciously ignored Windstar's fraud when it approved Windstar's recognition of revenue for the suspicious transactions, not to mention changing off the lead auditor and replacing him with uh, inexperienced ones. There was admissible evidence in the course of the audit that GT learned of and advised against the use of ind indisputably deceptive accounting schemes, but eventually acquiesced in the schemes, becoming part of it, just like Arthur Anderson. So, everything gets reversed. Aiding and abetting under the SEC Rule 10B. Under 10A of the 1934 Securities and Exchange Act, what do auditors have to do if they suspect a client is committed and ill legal act, eh, like fraud. Well, they're required under this 1934 federal law to notify the board of directors. It's required. Now, if the board of directors takes no action, what do the auditors have to do then? Then they have to issue an official report to the board of directors. Now, when the official re report from the auditors is received, the law requires that the company notify the SEC within one business day and send a copy of that notification to the auditors. Now, if you have like Enron, a situation, of course, we didn't have uh, Arthur Anderson doing anything, uh, finding any uh, malfeasance at uh, Enron or WorldCom, um, but just assume for the moment they, uh, they did, what happens if uh, they don't get a uh, copy of the notification from the board of directors to the SEC? Guess what? The auditors required to rat out, that is to report within one, one business day, uh, a report to the SEC themselves using the Edgar system. The Edgar system is the online electronic system, and that's really the way most reports go to the SEC today. 
is through Edgar. And I recommend you take a look at Edgar, just Google Edgar, E-D-G-A-R, and you get a chance to look at the SEC's website. So what about liability for accountants in terms of liability, joint and several liability? Well, <clears throat> accountants and their firms are jointly and severally liable. So not only is the client liable, you may have the accounting firm uh, liable too, as we've seen in some of our previous you know, cases. Is criminal liability possible? Well, we've had both the Department of Justice and the IRS, for example, the Mark, uh, Martha Stewart M-Clone scandal. You may remember uh, Sam Waxel, the CEO of um, M-Clone, found out a drug patent was going to be uh, turned down by the FDA. And so he not only sold all his M-Clone stock um, based on this insider information, but he also had his daughter do the same. And through her stockbroker, he contacted Martha Stewart and got her to do the same thing. Well, of course, Stockwatch is the agency that and program that watches trades on Wall Street, and when you see uh, CEOs and members of the board of directors and other senior executive officers trading in their own stock, buying and selling, this raises all sorts of uh, red flags, especially when <laughs> bad news is uh, shortly forthcoming. So the question comes up, what obligations, what legal obligations do accountants have regarding clients? Well, the first one is, you know, uh, auditors um, cannot have uh, any financial or business interest with a client. That includes family members. So if you're auditing ABC Corporation and your wife uh, or your children happen to have stock in that corporation, you're not eligible for being uh, for conducting, being on an audit team. And I think you can see the inherent conflict of interest there. Accountants who engage in unethical or improper professional conduct can be banned from the practice before the SEC, like for life. The last thing we're going to cover is what's called the Internal Revenue Service Restructuring and Reform Act, federal law, that provides some protection for confidential communications between uh, accountants, or auditors, and their clients. Now, what's important to know is that uh, this law doesn't apply to criminal actions, so there's no client confidentiality uh, uh, privilege uh, involved in criminal actions being investigated by the government, state or federal. Uh, civil cases that do not involve the U.S. government or cases involving other federal agencies like the SEC, um, this doesn't apply to. And so... Otherwise, so in essentially just civil types of cases, there's a client uh, privilege with uh, their accountants. So some states even provide, like California and New York, accountant-client privileges, but we do not have one in South Dakota. A good reason to draft one, right, to see if you could get the uh, legislature to adopt it. Working papers of an accountant are the actual property of uh, the accountant. They can't be shown to third parties without a client's permission. And of course, you have to allow client access to their own papers. And under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, the accountant is required now to retain them for seven years. So this obviously uh, is something that um, would prevent uh, shredding. Uh, when you've got a potential subpoena coming down the uh, the pipeline. Well, this is quite a bit that we've covered here today, but I wanted to uh, give you some uh, background as to the storytellers, why they're important in the language of business, and why the function that they perform is uh, important uh, to business, and why they exercise so much responsibility in the field of numbers and accounting. They matter, right?
Well, let's hear from you if you have any questions or issues that you need assistance with. Stay well. Bye-bye.